So we're gonna be talking about how to separate a solution. So a solution, a homogeneous mixture. We have evaporation, distillation, and chromatography. In evaporation, if you had a solution of salt water, if you let the water evaporate, you'd be left with just the salt. So distillation is a way to physically separate a mixture of liquids based on their boiling point. We have a flask, which contains the mixture and it's heated. When the substance with the lowest boiling point starts, reaches its boiling point, it'll start to boil and so it'll boil first. If it has the lowest boiling point, then that means it must have the lowest intermolecular forces. So here in this picture, we have blue water and this orange alcohol. We have a mixture of it. Notice as it's being heated, the alcohol is vaporizing first. As it vaporizes or as the vapor rises, it cools and condenses. To help with that condensing and cooling, you generally have water going on both sides of the tube on the outside to help cool that tube down to condense the vapor. As it condenses, it goes down and now we have just alcohol. Once the temperature starts to rise again, we know that the boiling point or all of the alcohol has left the container and so now the temperature is increasing. When it hits the next constant temperature, we're at a new substance's boiling point and so we would change this flask out on the right to keep collecting the different substances if we had more than just two liquids. So remember, boiling point is always held constant as it's undergoing boiling. So this would be the boiling point and it's constant until it's completely done boiling away. If you had an aqueous solution of NO2, NaCl, and chlorine, which would you expect to distill first? I'm going to pause the video and answer that one. So the one that distills first has the lowest boiling point, which is the lowest IMF. NO2 is polar, NaCl is ionic, and chlorine is LDF. Because it is an aqueous solution, we also have water as an option. And so of those four, chlorine, we would expect to have the lowest intermolecular force without more data given. Go ahead and pause the video and try number two on your own. So same type of question. In this case, we had LDF for CCL4, LDF for iodine, H2S is polar, so dipole dipole, and hydrogen, our water has hydrogen bonds. And remember that H2S and H2O also have LDF. Of those, LDF we would expect to be weaker and to find the weakest one, we want the least amount of electrons. So iodine has 53 times 2, or 106 electrons. And then CCL4, each chlorine has 17, so 17 times 4. And then carbon has 6, so that's a total of 74 electrons. So less electrons would, have a, would be less polarizable. So CCL4 we would expect to distill first. Chromatography is another physically way to separate a mixture of liquids, but this one is going to be based on their polarities. In chromatography, substances are separated as they travel in a mobile phase, which passes through a stationary phase. In paper chromatography, the stationary phase is a piece of chromatography paper. The mobile phase will either be liquid or gas. Most of the time it's gonna be a liquid. So in this case, our solvent is our mobile phase and our paper was our chromatography. And the overall separation depends on how strongly attracted the chemicals are to either the mobile phase, which is the solvent, or the stationary phase, which is our paper. So the substance more attracted to the solvent will travel the furthest up the paper. The substances that are more attracted to the paper will not travel as far. Generally, the paper will be one polarity and the solvent will be the other polarity. So if we're using water as our solvent, it would be polar, we'd wanna use a nonpolar paper.
And so we can see that red is the least attracted to the solvent, while the yellow seems to be the most attracted to the solvent. So when performing a chromatography experiment, these are your steps. You're gonna get a very small amount of the solution that you're trying to separate, and you're gonna spot it on a strip of filter paper or chromatography paper, and allow that to dry. So here's our strip of paper. Notice that our test solution is just one little dot a few inches or centimeters above the end of the paper. Then the strip is vertically placed into a jar containing a small amount of the solvent. You wanna make sure that your solvent line is below the line of the solution. We want that solvent to go up the paper some, hit the dot, and then start to separate. You don't want the dot in the solvent or it's gonna start spreading into the solvent. So as the solvent is drawn up the strip by capillary action, it dissolves the sample. The various solutes have different affinities or attraction to the paper and to the solvent, and thus they can be separated as the solvent moves up the strip. Once it's done separating, you need to pull the strip out before the solvent front reaches the top of the strip. So here's the solvent front. So it's gonna be, you can see the liquid traveling up the paper. You don't want the front to go all the way to the very top because you wanna see how far that solvent traveled. So always stop it before it reaches the very end of the paper. So then we record the distance that the solvent traveled. So here was the initial position of the solution. So we start with that line that we started at and then to where the solvent front was. That is the distance that the solvent flowed. So in this case, 5.4 centimeters. Then we need to record the distance that the color traveled or the other solute. So if we were looking at this dot, we notice in the middle of that dot, so we measure from the middle, it went 2.7 centimeters because it started here and it went to that spot. So to calculate the RF value for each component, substances that interacted strongly with the paper, again, do not travel very far. They have a low RF value. So this one has a lower RF value than this darker dot above it. While those that interact strongly with the solvent travel much further and have high RF values. So our RF for this one would have been 2.7 over 5.4, which is a 0.5. So here's some types of questions that you could see. Notice since all of these dots are on the same starting line, we don't have to calculate the RF factor. But if I was comparing this strip to another strip, I would need to calculate the RF factor to see how far they went to be able to compare the two strips. So pause the video and answer questions one and two. Restart when you're done. So if they have similar molecular structures, they should have traveled roughly the same. So on here, so A and D traveled roughly the same distance. For number two, from the diagram shown, which ink contains a component likely to have a molecular structure most similar to the solvent, which means it should have traveled the most with the solvent. Well, B traveled the most with the solvent, so it must be the most similar to the solvent. So if our solvent was polar, then I would expect B to be polar. If our solvent was nonpolar, I would expect B to be nonpolar. And one more, go ahead and pause the video and answer this one. So water was your mobile phase, which is polar. After an hour, which substance would have moved the farthest on the paper? Well, if it's moving the farthest on the paper, it wants to travel with the water, so we're looking for the one that is the most polar or most similar to water. B is nonpolar. D is nonpolar. A and C have polarity, but A can hydrogen bond, while C can only accept hydrogen bonds. So A is the most similar to water, so it would have traveled the furthest on the paper. Finally, this one isn't separating solutions, but we can also use a lab technique to figure out the concentration of a solution if it's a colored solution. 
So the absorbance of a compound is often integral to determining the concentration of a solution. Because absorbance is directly proportional to concentration of the light absorbing species in the sample. So for example, copper two nitrate appears blue because when light passes through it, the dissolved copper ions absorb the red components of the light while transmitting the blue portions of the light. So the instrument that measures absorbances and transmissions is a spectrophotometer. When doing a spectrophotometry experiment or trying to find the concentration of a solution based on how much light it absorbs, we use Beer's Law or Beer-Lambert's Law. A or capital A is the absorbance. This one is the molar absorptivity in molarity per centimeters. This is going to be a constant. B is the path length. And then C is concentration and molarity. Here we have a light source and we have our solution. Our solution is a light blue solution, it, it looks like. So we have our light and it's going to be passed through this sample in a cuvette or a test tube. So B is path length, and that is our cuvette or test tube, how wide it is. So is it one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters? So generally this is a cuvette or test tube that's placed inside the machine. A light is shined through the machine or through the sample, I should say. And if more light is absorbed, then that means it must have been a higher concentration. So the detector will detect less light, saying that more was absorbed. So the higher the absorbance, the higher my concentration would have been because absorbance is directly proportional to the concentration. When doing a Beer's Law problem, the first thing you've got to do is find the maximum absorbance for the compound of interest. We do so by finding the absorbances at lots of different wavelengths. Once we construct this curve, we're going to look for maximum absorbance. What wavelength corresponds to the maximum absorbance? If you said around 510 nanometers, you are correct. So this would be 500, and it's a little bit more than 500, so I would say it's around 510. So this curve is a graph of the concentration of various known samples that bracket the concentration range expected from the unknown sample. So when creating this curve, we would have one concentration, and we would measure that one concentration at lots of different wavelengths to find the maximum absorbance. Then we would make this Beer's Law plot. To make the Beer's Law plot, we have lots of concentrations. Let's say that we think that our concentration may be between 0.2 and 0.4. Then we have lots of concentrations around that, and then we plot the absorbances of these known concentrations. So we bracket the concentration range expected for the unknown sample and get all of the absorbances. This curve will then allow an unknown sample to be analyzed. So on the y-axis, if you notice, we have absorbance. And then on the x-axis, we have concentration and molarity. Once we've got all of our plots of concentration versus absorbance, we're going to make a line of best fit. This is our line of best fit here. Once we have our line of best fit, then we can plug in the absorbance or concentration that we don't know. So we put in our sample, we get its absorbance, and then we can solve for concentration because we would know absorbance, which is our Y, and we'd be solving for this X here. So what happens to absorbance when a solution is diluted? So if we have a weaker solution, will more of the light be absorbed or less of the light be absorbed by the particles? Go ahead and pause the video and write down what you think. So less light would be absorbed by the solution, so absorbance would decrease. What would happen to the absorbance if a colorless solution is used? Again, our particles have to block the light going through it. So if this is a colorless solution, then the light will just pass right through and none of it will be blocked.
So this would be a useless technique if we had a solution such as sodium chloride and we were trying to figure out what molarity we had because all of the readings would read zero. So none of the light would be absorbed. It would pass straight through, so absorbance would be zero. So we can only use a spectrophotometer when we have a colored solution. So think about what would happen to the absorbance if that cuvette had a fingerprint on it. So if this cuvette has a fingerprint on it, what do you think that's gonna mean in terms of absorbance of the solution? Pause the video, restart when you're done. So if a fingerprint is on the cuvette or test tube, it's gonna scatter the light more than if there was no fingerprint there. So if some of the light is being scattered before it even reaches the solution, it's going to appear that the solution absorbed more than it actually did, so less will be reaching the detector. So the light would scatter when it hit the fingerprint, so less light would hit the sensor. This would make the absor absorbance of the solution seem higher than it actually was. So we would assume that our concentration was greater than it actually is. Because remember, absorbance and concentration are directly related. And finally, what would you need to change in the experiment if you changed the color of the solution? So if this was no longer a blue solution or purple solution, and let's say it was a green solution or a red solution, where would I need to change my experiment? What would I need to do differently if I changed the color? Remember that this first graph is based on maximum absorbance at different wavelengths. This wavelength is only if it's a blue, blue solution. If I have a red solution or a green solution, the max wavelength would be different. Because again, the copper two nitrate appears blue because white light passes through the solution and the copper ions are absorbing the red components of the light. So if I have a red solution, then it would absorb different components of light. So a new standard curve, again, standard curve was this one, would need to be created. And then I would do my new Beer's Law plot based on that new max wavelength. So a new standard curve would need to be created so a new max absorbance could be determined for the new color. And then we would run the entire experiment again.